Welcome everyone to the Saskatoon Public Library Zoom programming. Um, thank you to our program partner, the University of Saskatchewan MFA in Writing Program, and to Ian Cannon for, Cannon for sharing insights into the short story. This program is coming to you from uh, Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. On behalf of the Saskatoon Public Library, I pay respect to the indi Indigenous ancestors of this place and affirm our collective commitment to reconciliation. And with that, I will hand things over to Ian. Hey everyone. I was just telling uh, Theresa that uh, my uh, mouth is a little dry, so I may put a hole in to see how it survives as I talk. So can everyone see the presentation? And do you see my notes or just the presentation? I, uh, we see your notes too. Oh, okay, let me just try that again. Oh, I did it by desktop instead of the window. There we go. Looks good. Now it's just a presentation, right? That's okay. right. All right. So yeah, today I uh, am today I'm Ian Cannon, uh, and today I want to talk about the short story uh, and why I think it's the best place for writers, uh, beginning writers, to start. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the differences between a short story and a novel. And then I also want to break down what I think are kind of the fundamental parts of writing a short story. I'm going to provide a little bit of examples for most of them, not all of them, but, but most of them. So just some a little bit notes about me. Uh, as I said, I'm in Canon. I'm a Métis writer, uh, originally from Edmonton. Um, I've published one novel. It's a long way down. You can see it right there. Um, I'm currently on the final pass for uh, of my second novel, but it's been a while. Well, uh, it was almost done when I started my MFA, and I just didn't quite get a chance to finish it. And now it's just kind of you know stuck in limbo until I finish the thesis. Um, <clears throat> I also host a monthly podcast with the university. Uh, we just had Teresa on. Uh, who puts on his workshops, as you know. Uh, and she's been celebrating her release of her short story collection, so I wanted to get shouted out. Uh, only if we're caught. So thank you, Theresa. Uh, and if you're interested uh, in the short, short story collection, definitely check it out. So why the short story? Well, I probably don't have to convince anyone here, I don't think, uh, why the short story is worth delving into, because I assume everyone's here of their own volition. Nobody's here against their will. But I still want to preface why I think the short story is a really perfect place to start for the beginning writer. Uh, when I started my MFA, uh, my planned thesis was a third novel. Uh, but then I started reading a lot of short stories for the, uh, my very first class in my first semester, and specifically Guy Vanderhey's collection, uh, Daddy Lennon. Uh, and I felt there's this like magic or, or freedom or, or something going on in short stories that I, that I didn't realize was going on. And I really want to start exploring them. And so the, the more I thought about it, I realized there's actually this very huge advantage to focusing on short stories. Um, and it's really just whenever you create a piece of writing, uh, you're essentially you're building in stages. So the first stage, you might do a plot outline. Then you might build some characters that fit in that outline. Then you might start writing the first draft. <clears throat> then you might do a second draft focusing on like plot structure. Then you might do a draft focusing on like dialogue or voice or detail, uh, or you might focus on the writing quality. And then finally you'll do an editing pass, right? And then finally you have a completing work. Well, if you're, if you're doing a novel, that process maybe takes two years, you know, on a, on a good year, like a, a, good, a good rate, two years. Um, and so say you, you, you're doing a year and a half, right? And you're not even at the editing process yet. So you're missing this whole stage that you haven't even started trying yet. Um, but with a short story, say in a year and a half, you do 12 short stories. Well, you've gone through that sta whole stage 12 times. You've learned every single stage and you kind of have some familiarity with what it's like to build uh, a, a writing piece. Um, and, I, and I think if, if you were to go to the novel first anyway, it's kind of like writing, uh, trying to run a marathon. You know, you've only done a few K here and there. Well, you're probably going to fail that marathon. You know, you're probably going to fail that first novel. So to start hitting the, hitting the writing process and completing projects through short stories, I think is the right way to go. And a, a question I call me asked writers on my podcast is some variety of what's the difference between a short story and a novel? 
<clears throat> I think they're relatively the same, but there, there's some, some main differences uh, that I want to point out. Um, one, I think the biggest thing is it allows you, for stories at least, it allows you some freedom to play. Um, readers are going to give you a little more room to experiment. They're going to allow you, allow you to create like kind of silly, annoying voices if you want to. You don't have to. Um, it's going to allow you to play with main characters. You know, you can make some that are despicable or some that people don't like. You know, you can you can you have a lot more room to play because people are not in it for like a you know a twelve hour ride. Um, in a novel, however, you know, rule rule breaking is a little harder to get away with. Of course, it's still possible, and there's a lot of examples of people getting away with it. But for for a newer writer, it's it, it, I wouldn't recommend experimenting on a novel um just because yeah they, they they're giving up 12 hours if you know depending on you know, how big your novel is 12 hours is probably a little big but still they're, they're giving a lot of time to you so you probably if you're gonna do experimentation you you want to stick to a short story <clears throat> and i think for a new writer who hasn't quite found their voice yet um i think experimentation experimentation is such a huge benefit uh you get to kind of find out what voices you like you get to see um and that, that finding out what voice you like is, is what I've been doing in my short story collection. But you get you get to quickly dive into like different genres. You can do play around POVs. You can create super strong narrators. You can create strange plot devices, non-linear plots. Um, and for me, in my first two novels, they're they're very straightforward. They're they're very you know third person, limited, omniscient. Um, you know, very linear. Uh, not a lot of humor. Uh, and I've, I've tried to branch out of that a lot with my. Uh, short fiction because I've been able to ask myself, what do I like? What do I want to see? What do I like reading? Um, and so I've been able to experiment a little bit more. Um, but beyond the experimentation, I think there are, there are small differences as well, um, just because there's a necessity of time in a short story, um, which show up between the differences show up between a novel that necessitated time and a short story. So, for example, characters are going to be less developed in a short story. Uh, the plot's going to start much nearer to the end. Exposition should be rare. Um, and you're gonna have a really you're gonna need a really good reason to have exposition if you do in a short story. Um, in a short story, the reader is often trying to figure out the rules of the world. Uh, they're kind of, they're gonna be kind of dropped into the world with no explanation. Whereas a novel, it's actually the opposite, where the novel is gonna try and teach you the world, uh, explain it to you. So a novel catches you up, a short story, you're off the playing catch up. And I think that's where a little bit of the magic comes from. You're trying to kind of de decipher what's going on in this short story. You know, you're, you're playing catch up. Of course, I love both forms. I, I don't want to pick either either one. I will be writing both for the rest of my life. Um, and and there are some odd ones though, like uh, Alice Munro or George Saunders or Chekhov, Donald Barthame, who are who are very strong, more focused short short fiction writers. Some of them, like George Saunders, uh, I think Barthame uh, has some novels, but they're mostly short story writers. And it goes, I think, usually it goes the other way around, where novelists there's a lot of novelists who don't publish a lot of short stories, but Let's move to more specifically this short story. Um, I've identified some, some what I think are the crucial elements here. Uh, of course, this list is not all encompassing. Um, if there's anything that, that you're interested about short stories, I, 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 I'd uh, ask you to write it down when we talk about the end, because I'm gonna obviously miss stuff. Of course, we're, we're locked for time here. Um, so it's a short, dense thing. And in writing, there's a million different things you can talk about. You know, I could do a, a thing on plot for two hours, um, but we got about 50 minutes. So we're, we're gonna do an all encompassing fundamental kind of course on the short story. So a little bit of fundamentals. This is more fundamentals of writing. This could be relatively applied to, to all writing. Um, but as a painter, you know, it needs to know how to write. And this course is more directed uh, to some, somewhat newer writers who, who are, you know, they want to know why short stories are a good way to kind of jump into writing. Um, a writer needs to know how to write. Uh, and of course, for every writing rule, I just want to make another stipulation. There are going to be a million writers who broke them, but I think you'd be very hard pressed to find a writer who broke them well, did a good job by breaking them, and didn't know the rule they're breaking. So you should know the rules if you're going to. Um, but here's some here's some fundamental rules of writing, um, and if you if you notice one and you're like, oh, I didn't know that, I, I, I uh, suggest you write it down. I'm not going to go into them very deeply. These are just more signals, like where do you need where's where's the fundamentals lacking. And, and just a, just a note, these are things that I've noticed in a lot of newer writers. When I'm doing um, first round reads, if I'm doing reads for magazines, if I've had people send me stuff or I'm doing paid edits, uh, stuff like that. These are things I've noticed that are common to someone who I'd consider a newer writer. So first, very, very famous. Lots of writers talk about it, active versus passive. So an active sentence is when the subject of the sentence is the one doing the action. 
So an example would be Sue changed the flat tire. So Sue is a su the subject and she's doing the action. She's changing the flat tire. A passive version of that would be the flat tire was changed by Sue. And that's because now the flat tire is the subject of a sentence and the actor is actually the passive second part by Sue. And so it's flipped. The, the, the subject is no longer the actor. It's being acted upon. And so just generally, most writers believe, and I think there, there are times where maybe a passive would work. Um, for example, when you don't know who, who, the, uh, who the subject is, uh, or, or if you want to leave it a mystery. But generally, the rule, the rule holds that you should be focusing more on active sentences. They're more engaging, the more uh, you, you jump into, you see the action unfold. Um, punctuating dialogue. So commas go inside uh, dialogue takes. So if, if you say said, then it's still part of the sentence. Now, if you do a, 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 an action, like um, John got up or John waved his hand, you know, then you can do a period. Um, and those I see mixed up sometimes. Sometimes you see a comma outside, sometimes you see the period outside. <clears throat> or I see a comma for an action. Um, but next one is paragraph breaks in dialogue. But generally, paragraph breaks in dialogue or meant to signal there's a change in a speaker. Um, and some people don't follow this rule. You know, again, you're going to find examples. Kermit McCarthy is a good example. Um, he goes way off base on dialogue, but he makes it work. Um, but for me, I think just for readability, uh, you're gonna do a paragraph break in times so there's a change in speaker. Um, the next one, again, very famous rule, dialogue tags stick to said. You know, you're gonna do he said, she said, John said. Um, the reason for that is because they're only there to indicate who's speaking. They're not really there to distract anyone. You don't wanna do yelled, whispered, uh, honked, you know, just for a second. Because uh, it's, it's odd, you just want to say, you're just trying to indicate who said something, you're not trying to spice it up. It's, it's really just like a practical, functional uh, device, the SEDS. Um, and if you want to mix it up, I think I would say do an action, you know, spice up an action or make the, if you, if you really need to feel like you need to say yelled or, or something different, then you maybe change the word choice to more indicate a yelling word phrase. <clears throat> Addressing the person in dialogue. I've noticed this and it's something I used to do as well. New writers will have the uncanny ability to add too many names. So if you're, uh, if, if in dialogue, you're, you're saying something like, how are you doing, John? I'm doing well, Michael. Uh, well, how's your day going, John? You know, over and over and over. And it becomes very odd. You know, people don't really speak and say the names as much as you think they do. Um, and I'm not sure, sure why new writers seem to do that, but it, it does seem to be very common. Um, but yeah, it's just, you can remove them and, and you know, the, the tags are gonna be there. You're gonna know who's speaking to who. Um, quickly, comma splices. Uh, this is a subject verb pairing uh, and a, two subject verb pairings. A, a, a complete sentence is a subject and verb or subject verb object. And if you have a comma between those two, it's gonna be a comma splice. So the example I had there is John wants to go to the store or went to the store, it was empty. There's a comma between them because it was is a subject verb and John went subject verb and you have prepositions there or objects. Um, so just look for the subject verb, subject verb, and you're going to know which are complete sentences. Starting a sentence with a gerund. A good example would be starting the car, I peeled out of the street. So this is implying actually that starting the car and peeling out of the street are happening at the exact same time, um, which is just logically incorrect, not grammatically, but just logically. Um, gerunds themselves, starting with a gerund, is not grammatically incorrect, but it can be awkward the same way as an active and passive verb. Uh, and the next one, dangling modifiers, very similar. So the example I have is walking down the street, the trees were beautiful. Well, the person walking down the street is actually missing. So this modifier is modifying a, a missing subject. So it's dangling at the time. Um, so you'd want to you want to add in the actual subject. But just in general, those sentences that start with the ing verbs, just be, be wary of them. Avoid cliches. So Russian formalists came up with this term defamiliar, defamiliarization. As in make things new, you know, don't rely on cliches, try out new ways to say things. Um, I wouldn't say do it overly, you know, there's a middle ground there, um, but don't heavily rely on cliches. Uh, it's gonna be take the readers out of the story when they read them. Put away this thesaurus is the next one. When you lose sight of a goal, which is really to tell a good story and you kind of start plugging in these like, like 25 cent words, which there are obvious simpler words choices, it kind of becomes clear I think that you're a novice. Um, because it, the goal really is, yeah, this whole story, not to use big words. And the last one, overly sentimental language. In that same vein, 
Uh, be careful who you're, uh, how you're relaying plain basic information if you're using overly sentimental poetic language to convey basic things. So for example, don't describe a lampshade as like a blistering shade of heartfelt aching pink. It's gonna be odd. People are gonna be like, I don't know. Is that deserved to be? That kind of overemphasis in poetic language? I, I doubt it. And again, obviously, these are, there's a lot more than this, um, but these are things like major things I've noticed with newer writers that I just wanted to point out before we moved on. So on, let's go to short stories specifically. So in any, any skill, I think the, the best thing you do is you gotta know yourself. What kind of writer are you? Um, there's an old, there's an old uh, plotting thing called the plotter or the pantser. And that's, do you have to plot out your entire story kind of like an architect before you get started? Or do you just have a, like an idea or concept or an image uh, before you begin writing? So I just started looking at the chat, I got distracted. Personally, when I, when I write a short story, I, uh, I like a quasi mixture of both. So I wouldn't say I'm either or. Um, I, I like to do like a paragraph maybe. And then from that paragraph, I allow myself to kind of go outside of that paragraph if I want to. Really, I'm not gonna really know what I have till I write a first draft. Um, so I try and do a little bit of both. I'll do a plot, like I'll write out the entire plot from beginning to end. And then if I feel like it's not working, I'll, I'll change it. Um, but once you have some idea of which one you are, there, there, there are a lot of plot types to choose from. Uh, one of the more famous plot devices, which is common, I think, to the novel and not as much to the short story, is a hero's journey. Uh, I have a little picture there, bottom left. Um, it can be done, of course, in short stories, but there's a, like a bit of required exposition, I think, that kind of makes that format undesirable. Um, so, so I guess what, what does make a good plot? Something I would say that has high stakes. Something there's something to lose, there's something to gain. There's embarrassment at stake, death, pain. The stakes gotta be high with whatever plot you do end up choosing. Um, that's why we're there to read it. That's why we're engaged because there's high stakes. There's something going on. You should also be character desire. So your characters need to want something to propel the plot forward. Um, imagine this little lovely short story that I uh, made for you guys. A waiter asks, can I get anything else? And the customer replies, no, thank you. I have everything I need. Well, that's, that's the end of the story. That's brilliant. That's all we got. Um, so like, obviously a character needs to want something for the plot to continue on. If they don't want anything, the story's gonna die right there. You know, you have to have a character who moves. And on that, on that uh, subject, you need an active protagonist. Um, not only should your characters have desires, they need to be actively driving or failing. You know, being failing towards a desire is also being active, but they need to be driving or failing towards something. You know, they need to be doing something. Um, the plot needs to move in a direction, but you also have to be careful that your plot it's not what's moving and your character standing still. Um, so you want really the plot to be working on the character and the character to be working on the plot in a kind of feedback loop. You don't want one or the other only. Because obviously, if a character does something, the plot around it, around that character should react differently and it will create another cause and effect and you have this cause and effect feedback loop. So let's some examples of short story plots. So I just wrote a couple here that I'll, uh, off the top of my head uh, over last week. You have the uh, typical day break, uh, or typical day, a break from the routine. Uh, a boring character finally breaks out of the routine, and a series from that break of cause and effects occur because of this decision. Um, and then you have external conflict. So it's similar to a break from the routine, but it's external conflict that causes it. It's not just like an internal, uh, life's boring, I gotta, I gotta do something. Um, so this could be more like aliens attack, parents divorce, a baby shows up at the doorstep, their wife dies, you know, they win a lottery. Um, that's an external conflict comes up. Uh, then you have an internal conflict. That's uh, a character's interior life. So on a typical day, you know, it's a typical day, not quite all the routine, but this typical day is riddled with internal anxiety. That's what's driving the plot forward. Maybe a character is internally conflicted about maybe a marriage coming up or they're weighing in the world against someone they're having some self-doubt or whatever it is, there's internal conflict that's driving them to take action and be active and, and do things. Uh, another one is compressed time period. So I think this is a, a very easy way to make, you know, some, something more, a little more compelling uh, and more focused and more tension filled. Um, this could be like a single day, a single hour, a single minute. Uh, for example, John Eipdyke's uh, A&P, it takes place over maybe, I think, 15 minutes. Uh, the main character, he's a, a, a bag boy in a grocery store. He witnesses a scene and quits his job. That's, that's basically the whole story. Um, but it's condensed, but he has internal conflicts about whether to quit his job. Tobias Wolf's uh, A Bullet in the Brain, 
Uh, that takes place for the majority of the story within nanoseconds of the bank robber shooting him in the head. Um, very interesting story. It just takes place in a little span of time that he still has some kind of synapses firing right before he dies. Uh, suspense as opposed to withheld information or surprise. And I want to talk about this one because I think some people sometimes get confused. Surprise for suspense. Um, as Hitchcock said, a bomb that suddenly goes off is a surprise, but it doesn't really add anything to the plot. Uh, as in, it doesn't move the plot along um, and it doesn't set up a plot. Uh, it's just a surprise. Now you can set up the plot if you suspense, you know, a reader knows there's a ticking bomb under the table, but the couple doesn't know. So the reader is not seeing this plot move forward, right? But with the suspense, the reader does see the plot move forward and they're on the edge of your seat and they're seeing a, a high stakes moment rather than just a surprise coming in and it's out of nowhere. Um, so for example, again, a reader knows that there's a ticking bomb under the table while the couple argues over a tip, refusing to leave on time. The reader's on the edge of your seat. The plot will just unfold as it does from there. So really suspense adds stakes, surprise doesn't. Uh, there'll be stakes after, but doesn't add stakes before the moment of surprise. Originality, and the reason I wanna put originality here first or, or include this in here, is because sometimes you have a very original idea, a very, a very revolutionary idea, but it can take away focus from you know, just good plot. You know, you're, you're very focused on this very wild idea, but you're missing you know, good characters or active characters or you know, high stakes. You just have a, you're very focused on this interesting, weird, you know, let's say time travel, uh, interconnected plot. Um, and that's gonna overshadow the, the actual story, which is the point of what you're doing. You're not doing an interesting plot, you're doing a story really. Now the, the story, the, the interesting plot is a vehicle to the story, but it shouldn't be uh, overshadowing the actual point of what you're doing, which is the story. And then the other thing is, you know, it may not just actually be original. Uh, and finally, one of my favorite techniques of making plot is ex escalation. And there's a very famous uh, story by Donald Barthame. It's called uh, The School. So in, in this short story, the classroom essentially adopts or brings in larger and more serious animals. You know, so it was like bugs to rats, to cats, to dogs. Uh, and, it, and it keeps going up and up and up until parents and children start dying. Um, so every animal they bring in, they just somehow kill the animal. And then people start dying around them. Um, and it's just like this very simple case of just escalation. It's very, very effective. And the reason it's very effective is because one, he takes it to a limit that you didn't expect. You thought maybe he's gonna stop at animals, but he, he goes right on to children uh, and adults. So it's both, both daring and riveting. You know, he goes beyond the expectations. Though, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, he does flip the ending on the head. I think it's a very effective way to take escalation and pattern-based stories and not see them through. We'll talk about it a little bit later. So here, here's uh, two pictures. Uh, the top is a novel. This is a general novel structure. And this, the bottom is a short story. So on the top, you can see there's a little bit more exp exposition at the beginning. You know, you have that almost hero's journey. Uh, a very classic example of the plot of a novel. You introduce, introduce the reader to the hero's world, perhaps like a village, like the Shire. And then there's like a rising action of an incident that raises throughout the novel, you know, where they get the ring and they go, they go off on the, their travels. They get to, they see Elrond and, you know, he keeps going up and up and up and up until they, uh, until Boromir probably dies at the end. It's probably the climax of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, not the book. I think that's the climax of the movie. I think the book, he dies in the second one. Uh, but then you have the fall in action, you know, after they go on the boat, it falls down to Denema, uh, and then you have a catastrophe or a conclusion. Catastrophe, probably if there's a second or third series, uh, as there is in Lord of the Rings, or conclusion if it's just a one, one book. Uh, but on the other hand, in a short story, you have, uh, it's starting right at the conflict, right at the ending, you know, as possible, as close as possible to the ending as, as you can without losing the essence of the story. You know, you want to be right there, like drop them right close to the end um, where they still going to understand what's happening. Uh, for example, Tobias Wolf's short story that we talked about, The Bullet in the Brain, it starts right in the bank, right when the, the robbing is taking place. Um, he's just standing in line and he starts melting back and then he gets shot in the head. That's the story. And then it's a condensed little nanosecond and takes up the rest of the story. So you can see, it starts in the conflict, it rises because he's melting off to the bank robber, Climax gets shot, and then it's just a nanosecond of the right before he dies and his reflections as he's dying. 
that spoiler. There will be some spoilers. <clears throat> Part three, beginning stories. So I've done a lot of uh, readings uh, and submissions for magazines and journals. So I know firsthand how important that like, like first paragraph is. If you don't hook the reader in your first paragraph, you're often not going to continue. So like, if I read a, a novel, I'm, I'm almost going to give it like maybe a hundred pages before I quit. A short story, I'm going to give very, very little. And I don't know, I don't know what it is, but it just seems like, because it's so short, it's like, ah, I'm going to, if I'm not into the first paragraph, I'm going to check out real quickly. But a novel feels like I'm committing by just opening it. So I'm going to commit to hundred pages. So that beginning in a short story is way more important than a novel, though they're both, of course, really, really important. The short story is like, you got to, you got to blast me right in the beginning. That's probably why it starts right in the conflict. Um, and again, I'm going to give you some tips for beginnings, but uh, you'll be able to find a ton of different stories that are going to break all these. Uh, so as we saw on the last slide, a short story should start with a conflict. It needs to start strong. It needs a hook immediately. Um, and those two things, it situates someone in the scene immediately, and it makes them interested. It hooks them immediately. Um, and one way to do this is to start the story at the moment, the very moment when I, you know, we were talking about the routine breaking. And the routine can break in many different ways, external, internal. Um, but like you'd want to start that right when it breaks, not before. You don't need to see who they were before. You want to see it right when it breaks. And then you can have just by the actions they do and stuff, you can kind of get the backstory exposition of who they are. You don't need to tell me. I'm going to find out through the, you know, through the way they act once they break out of that routine. So I think the easiest way to do that uh, without having to info dump and do a lot of exposition at the beginning is simply drop them into a direct scene. A, a reader does not have to know the context of the scene. As long as the scene is like rich in vivid detail, a reader is going to be engaged no matter what. They're going to be into it. Um, if it's a very good, detailed, uh, vivid, high stakes scene, uh, you may want to explain the background after that scene. If you want, I probably would advise against it, but that's your choice. Um, and I wanted to include the gift because this is a, someone dropping in on a parachute into a scene. And not only that, they're not just dropping in, stopping. They're hitting the ground running, not running, but uh, on a tricycle still, or uh, I don't know what it's called, Mon model something? Who knows? But if we started with a conflict and it has been dropped in the scene, there's some things I think you want to accomplish with that scene. It's not just get them excited and get them hooked. There's some things you need to do in that scene. So first of all, you need to introduce the characters and the relationships among them. Who are, who are we dealing with in the story? How can we show the reader the kind of people they are without even telling them? How can we just show them through the scene the kind of people that we're dealing with? Um, we want to introduce the readers to our characters without clearly introducing them to our characters. They're just going to recognize who they are through their actions. You also want to establish your tone, your voice, your genre, your point of view. Essentially, the storytelling approach that you're going to take when you do the story. We don't want the reader surprised. If like a realistic fiction turns into all of a sudden a magical realism piece or like an absurd existential piece, um, you're gonna be like, I, I thought I was reading a different story. You drop me into one scene and all of a sudden I'm in a new scene in a different genre. Um, that's gonna be confusing. There, there are writers who do it really well, who can do that. But again, this is, if you're more new to writing, you just take it a little step back. Uh, establish, so you also wanna establish a setting that you're gonna be in for them exists for most of the story. Again, it's very similar to the last one. You don't want to start in one place and end up in a way different place with no indication that you're going to get there. So if you're like, um, if you're going to go to Mars and you're starting on Earth, you probably want to start in NASA or something like that. You know, like a place that's indicating you may go to somewhere else. So when you get there, there's some level of respect of that, you know, cause and effect. Uh, and then finally, give us a reading, uh, a reason to keep reading. Essentially, you want to hook us, as we've said many times. Um, and there's a few ways to do this, I think. Um, one, you give us characters we're going to care about immediately. Uh, the most famous one is um, save the cat. You know, give, give, give them a scene where they save a cat immediately. Now you care about the person because they're a good person. Uh, or creates interesting situations in need of resolution. Um, so you have a dilemma and they're going to want to see, because you drop them a scene, you give them a dilemma. They're going to want to see the resolution dilemma. Um, but something has to be done in that first scene to keep us hooked. You know, you have to set all these things up. Um, and if you lost your attention again in that first paragraph, Page or scene, you're, you're probably not going to get it back. So you, you must do exposition, I, I would say, after all this has taken place, after you've hooked us already. If you, if you must do exposition to explain some things, wait till all this is already, or we're already hooked. And we're, we're going to be able to wait, you know, another few paragraphs of exposition. Don't do an info dump right from the get, because I'm, I'm like, why do I need to know all this information about a story I'm not even hooked on yet? <clears throat> 
Um, so a very, very famous opening line. I can't hear my mouth. As Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into an enormous insect. So that's the kind of opening that I think you want to write. Good luck. We're all trying to write. I think that the kind of opening, but that's, that's essentially like, that's an opening that you read again and you go, wait, what? What just happened? Like, what did I just get dropped into? What kind of story is this? And so like matter of fact, the strangeness is so like objective, like here is the world. Let's see what happens. And you're just compelled to see, okay, I'll get dropped into this, this very odd world where people can turn to insects. I'm in, I'm hooked. I got to see how this strange event turns out. And like that, that line, the single line on the paragraph on the page has you for the rest of the, has you for the rest of the book. So part four, let's go character. Um, and so when I first started writing, uh, I used to think that a good short story relied uh, on good plot, good devices. Uh, and, a, and a novel on the flip side was good character. I don't think that's true anymore. I think that uh, was, a, was a novice thing for me to think quite a few years ago. Um, I know why I thought that, but uh, I think you're gonna find a ton of different stories that have really, really strong of, of all those characteristics. Um, and I wouldn't start from that place of like a, a short story has to have one of these or one of these. Um, I think really good short stories like Kafka's Metamorphosis has really strong characters in it. But to me, uh, 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 just for a brief overview, <clears throat> I think there are four main parts to a character in a short story. The most obvious is going to be, what do they look like? Um, and it's something obviously you're going to know at the beginning, but what I think what people don't get the advice of is it's not what they look like. It's what they, how do they look different than everyone else in the world? You know, like what's something unique about them? Um, there's what, 8 billion people in the world. And, you know, if you had in all the fictional characters, how many is that? Well, you need a, a unique marker that makes them them. Um, I had an example, it's a silly example, but uh, like maybe their left eye had a permanent mark, a red mark from, you know, in the shape of an apple caused by a, a baseball when they were young, you know, something like that. Something that's unique that makes them like have a life outside of the, the, the uh, short story writing. And my personal favorite thing to do is habits. Um, it's one of my favorite character exercises. It's, it's what are your characters doing outside of stories? What are they doing when no one's looking at them? Uh, and we'll return to this one because I actually have an example of this one that I love. Um, so next one is voice. Your characters really should not sound like one another. If you remove those dialogue tags uh, you you, and you couldn't at least somewhat figure out who is speaking, well, their voices are probably not unique enough. Um, you want to you wanna have their, a unique way of saying, like everyone has a, a unique personality to the way they talk. Um, so your characters should have that too. Sometimes I'll, I'll look uh, movie actors up in their scenes and their roles. And I'll try to make a lexicon out of those by combining, you know, one or two different people. But I like having real, real world examples uh, of, of voices or lexicons that I can model off of. And finally, needs versus wants. Uh, this is a very popular way to do characters and plot at the same time. A character has a want, for example, they want to get drunk, right? That drives a the plot. They're going to go out and get drunk. That's, that's a plot device. They're gonna, that's what they're going to do. That's what the story is going to be about. <clears throat> on the surface, but they also have a need. And the need is that maybe they're going out to get drunk because they have a, a deeper sadness about being lonely, right? And that's a need. They want accompaniment. They want people around them. Um, so what it does is the, the want drives uh, the, the plot and the need drives a character. That's why they're doing it. That's what they need to solve. That can essentially be the resolution of the story. You know, do they, does a character meet the need they want or do they not? Um, and in the conversation uh, on Monday, that Teresa and I actually had, she came up with an, a, a different alternate to needs and wants that, are, that I, re I really found interesting. Um, she said to ask yourself, what is your character wrong about? So what's, what's something in life that they have a belief that they need to be challenged on or need to figure out or else they need to be reinforced, you know, however it is, but what's something they believe that's wrong um, and, and then they need to go through the act of the plot to figure out whether they're gonna solve it or not solve it. Um, and I think that's, that's close to needs and wants, but it's an interesting offshoot that I, that I think is worth uh, looking at. So as I, as I promised, I want to go into one of my favorite examples of characterization, which is Jip Rossetti from Boardwalk Empire. He's played by uh, Bobby Cannavale. Uh, if you're not familiar, Jip Rossetti is a big bad guy in season three of uh, Boardwalk Empire. He is quite the temper. Um, there's a scene, uh, it's quite far into season, I think, if I remember correctly. I haven't seen it in a while, but I think it's pretty deep into the season where you've already seen this big bad guy who has a, a temper, kills a lot of people. Um, and, and we get a little deep dive, a little, little extra scene where no one's looking. It's a scene where he's sitting down for dinner with his mother-in-law and his wife at a dinner table. 
And so again, he's a, he's a man who regularly kills people. He has a short temper and his wife and his mother-in-law are openly just mocking him and making him feel small, dehumanizing him. And what it does, it humanizes him as a character. It shows like this complexity of who he is and gives us insight into like, who is this man when nobody else is looking? You know, who is he uh, under the story? Um, and I think it's a really interesting way to look at your characters. Who are they off the page of your story? And how does that shape who they are on the page? Um, and more importantly, I think it makes them feel like a real character, that scene. Because it's a long form uh, television show, I'm not sure if you could actually use a scene like that. You, I'm sure you could come up with a way. But what I would more uh, suggest is you use scenes like that to build up who you think the character is, you know, kind of on a side thing, and you have a better understanding of your characters. Part five. So I've combined uh, POV and voice together. Because while all characters should have a unique voice, <clears throat> I think you should be finding your own voice, your, you know, your, your unique way of telling a story. And there's a, st a, short, a story that short story writer George Saunders uh, tells about his early career. He had handed a few stories into a publisher and they liked what he had sent in, but they had reported like, hey, something's missing though. Like, I feel like this is good, but it's not, there's something else. Uh, so Saunders quickly realized what that was. What he was doing, he was imitating Hemingway. So what he realized what was missing was his own voice himself. He was missing from his own writing. Um, and so what he did is he started working on finding his own voice. And I think that is really where short stories most benefit from because you can try on so many different masks, so many different hats. Um, you can do so many different points of views, voices, characters, you can do neutral, omniscient voices, subjective assholes. Uh, you can do unreliable narrators. You can, you can do all these different voices in search of your own voice, you know, and feel like what, what, what feels comfortable for me. And I think in a novel, you kind of are, are committing to a voice and you can change it, but it's hard. It's a very arduous process where you can just write a lot of short stories, especially when you're finding your voice. It's much more, I think, practical to find it in many stories rather than just hoping you got it the first time. So with voice, though, I don't have much advice because it's really your, your unique voice. You know, you, like I said, you have a way of talking yourself. So I can't tell you how to find that other than to read and write widely and to look for different voices. Um, you'll figure it out yourself just through writing and seeing what do I like to write? What do I feel like my voice is? Um, and yeah, you'll find it, I think. Uh, but with POV, you, I think you have a number of options. And this will help you, again, uh, find your own voice. <clears throat> with any short story, uh, I like trying all different types. So all, all, all different types, except for I haven't had much experience with second person. Um, but with first person, it's rel relatively simple. Um, these are inherently subjective stories because they're told from someone's point of view. Um, so if you just a word of warning, if you do want to add in any weirdness for magical realism or like absurd existentialism, you kind of have to be careful not to blur the lines between unintentionally like objective weirdness and unreliable narrators. Um, it, but it can be done. You know, Metamorphosis is told, I think, uh, not might be third person, actually. I don't know. I think it's third person. But I say if it was told from his person point of view, is he going crazy or is it? Objective, you know, that it becomes hard to tell. Um, so that's a, a little word of warning for the type of stories you can do in first person. You can do those magical realism stories, but it's hard to not, you know, make the, the, the reader ask, is this really happening or is it happening in my uh, POVs head? But this is where I think short stories shine in, in first person POVs. Um, third person is, is where I like to do novels. Now, second person is when you kind of use a pronoun, a personal pronoun, you, they're pretty rare. Uh, I have seen him use effectively. Uh, a colleague of mine wrote a time travel story where the future you is talking to the past you. Uh, and I think she did a very good job of utilizing that second person structure. Uh, and it was logical, it made sense because it's, it's, a, it's a future her talking to her past self. So she's talking to you herself. Um, third person POV though. I think this is probably where the more beginning writer feels comfortable. It's more of an authorial objective voice. Uh, it can remain neutral. Um, you have mostly like a, a separation between narrator and character. Of course, there's examples like, uh, it's called free indirect discourse where the voice of the character starts infiltrating the narrator. Um, but that's, you don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, but in this category, there's a few different things. There's objective POV, which is kind of reminiscent of a film camera. You know, it's, it's pointing around, but it's not uh, internal. Then you have omniscient POV which has uh, access to both the exterior world and the interior, interior world of the characters. Um, so it's both a camera and like an all-seeing eye, you know. Uh, and then you have limited omniscient POV, 
Uh, this is an omniscient point of view, external and interior, but limited to one viewpoint. Um, but in all three of these POVs, you can really play around with what does the reader know? Uh, what does the reader not know? What do the characters know that the reader doesn't know? Um, and you can kind of like use the narrator to kind of keep things from the reader and keep things uh, from the characters. Uh, you can play with that. Uh, and for example, of a strong voice, I want to take a little, 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 uh, this is why the picture's here, a little paragraph from uh, Nascent's, from Teresa's uh, collection, Only for Caught. So let's read this. I have not chosen correctly. Proxies are the oldest model in the world, already wrapping the alphabet in iterations. There is a gimme shelter right across the street. There are LL model proxies now, and I emphasize with them. I level with the stain. I smell coffee and oranges, but also a hint of rat, rancid meat and an ammonia. I hope LL iterations all have, have all sensory receptors disabled. So I think in this, in this story, it's Teresa has smartly chosen as her POV, uh, a first person robot narrator named Kendra. And Kendra, is like, as you can see, talks in these like very balanced sentences. She employs some jargon words because she, you know, she's a jargon based person. She has one role. Uh, there's some 25 cent words, but I think this is again, a really good example. Of, there's good reasons for them because she's a, a, a single role character. She does one job. She should have jargon because that's her job. Um, and she's also naive and innocent in this. So Teresa actually uses her very smartly to introduce the world through these chosen details. Um, she doesn't know much of the world outside. Um, so as she kind of, you know, figures out the world outside, we also kind of figure out the world outside. Um, but we can see also in this paragraph, uh, I think it occurs on page four out of 11, we see Kendra starting to develop. She's talking about processes in like almost a humorous, humorous way. There's talks of like stains and rancid meat. Um, there's some sense of empathy. She's almost evolving. So we kind of see this character start to build uh, and change uh, already throughout this piece. Um, we also see excellent POV voice detail. I think you see this in just one paragraph. Uh, part six, dialogue. So how to write effective dialogue. Dialogue for me has, has always been one of my strongest suits. Um, I grew up in a kind of snappy dialogue of the nineties. Um, the Pulp Fiction, Seinfeld, Snatch, uh, anything by Barry Levinson. Um, and this, these kind of things grew out of actually of Barry Levinson's uh, first film, uh, a movie about nothing, I like to call it, as Seinfeld and Seinfeld quote close. It's a 1982 film, Diner, uh, the original movie about nothing. Uh, and in, in the tradition of these works, uh, my advice, uh, the best advice I actually ever got for uh, dialogue was never have anyone answer anyone or the non-answer. I love the non-answer. And we'll take, a, we'll take a look at this on the next slide because I think it's very powerful to want to see an example of it. Um, but it's a very easy recipe, I think, to elevate your dialogue into realism uh, very effectively. And it's not hard to do. But once you see it, you're being like, oh, that, that, is, that is easy and, and, and effective because it feels more real. But it also plays really well into the third advice, which is I call the third thing, uh, which is when two characters are speaking to each other. And they're actually not talking directly about the thing that they're talking about. They're talking about a third thing. Um, and this is most famous, I think, in Hemingway's short story, Hills Like White Elephants. It's an American man and a woman. They're uh, on a train and they're discussing kind of everything about it, uh, everything around them um, and everything but the subject. You know, they're talking about the, how hills are like white elephants. Um, and a real subject they, they need to be talking about is abortion. Um, so it just adds like suspense and tension to each word. They're not talking directly about the, the thing they need to be talking about, but each word is more heavy because of that. Um, but beyond those kind of overarching things, here's some more practical dialogue advice. So avoid spellings, phonetic spellings and accents. And, and the reason for that is the reader has to be the actor of the accents. And a reader does not want to be acting the whole time they're reading. You know, I'm not a great actor. I don't want to be acting out an accent that I'm failing to do. And it makes the experience uh, lesser than um, I, I, there's, you're going to be able to find really easy examples of it succeeding, but I would hesitate a newer writer to try accents and connect spelling. Um, you want to mirror the emotion to the language. So a reader should be able to know the emotional state without like adding action statements or punctuation just by the word choice and the language that's being used. Um, if they can't, then maybe reconsider changing the language or what they're saying to more reflect the emotional state they're in. Dialogue tags, I won't, I won't uh, say this again because uh, I nailed it already, but uh, he, I said, she said, she said, um, empty talk. Don't start a conversation with like, hello, how are you? 
good, you, I'm good. This is how humans do introduce each other, but a reader doesn't care about that. They don't need to see it. You wanna skip right through that. This is supposed to feel like real life, not be real life. Um, exposition through dialogue is another good one that a newer writer will, will try and sneak it in. Um, this is when two characters who know each other very well ask each other silly questions like, hey, John, when did we meet each other? Was that back in college? Oh yeah, you were a philosophy major, right? Yeah, and then you had that girlfriend and you're like, did you guys know each other for 40 years? What, what the hell are they talking about? Why do they need to talk about this right now? It's because it's a very transparent way of informing the reader through dialogue. Uh, and it's very ineffective. It's very clear what you're doing. Um, if you have to do the exposition, just write it out. Don't use dialogue to do it. Um, and then being too formal. Uh, people are not formal generally when they're talking. So use contractions, use slang, use local dialogues, local variations, um, or dialects rather, and make the dialogue more lifelike, you know, without the filler. Don't do filler lifelike, but do casualness lifelike. So this is an example I want to show of three saying the same thing, but in a different way from direct to less direct to, to almost not direct at all. So uh, a character goes, where did you go? And he says, I went to sort of get eggs. This is pretty direct, not much going on. It just says what it is. Uh, mildly indirect, a bit better, maybe best depending on what you need to do, but it's, where did you go? We were out of eggs. So the question wasn't directly answered, but it feels much more natural to not actually answer the question. Suddenly it feels like you're, you're doing real life talking. You know, you don't say, where'd you go? You answer it with a statement. I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you where I went, I'm telling you what I did. Uh, and then the best, and I would say it's the best in certain situations, not always the best to do it this way. But where did you go? Did you know Barney's has a special eggs? We were supposed to go to yoga. I bought 12. Why? You should see the look on your face. Here, it's, it's best depending on what you want. So this dialogue actually reveals a lot about their relationship. Possibly he's missing out on stuff like yoga that they have planned to do dumb things like go buy eggs. Um, he's making fun of her. Like you should look in your face when she's obviously mad. He's acting childish. Um, it's telling a bit more about their relationship by just not answering the question. Now you're getting details of the character and who they are just because you didn't answer the question. So whenever you see like dialogue together, just avoid answering the question and think of how can I answer the question with a statement it doesn't, that, that answers it, but adds more to the character. Part seven, John Gardner, in a very famous statement, he said, vivid detail is the lifeblood of fiction. I added specific detail to this, um, but that is to, to uh, achieve very similitude, well-placed, but ostensibly innocuous details is kind of how you convince a reader that what's happening on the page is actually happening. Um, this is an area I think uh, I'm trying to improve on, on my own writing. I often will use like uh, very plain nouns or um, objects uh, without like very specificity. Um, and I'm always looking to heighten these generic nouns into like hyper-specific nouns uh, to kind of bring my world to life. Um, and a good example is just thinking about this, this little picture of the, the coffee shop here. <clears throat> if you want to create verisimilitude and realness, you can't actually name everything in that shop. You have to name very specific things that are going to make people feel like they can make the other things. So it's going to be like a domino effect in their brain. So if you maybe said like a, a guy on a wooden table, uh, like a hipster on a wooden table with a Mac computer, you, the rest of the thing may all, all of a sudden pop up to the reader just because they know what that kind of person is like in the, situ in the place they would be in. So you want to pick specific and vivid details that are going to make, that are going to do a lot of the labor for you and then create a domino effect that they'll, they'll create a full scene in, in a reader's head. Uh, this is a little exercise from uh, Robert Butler Olin. <clears throat> he had his students just uh, tell a story and then, and then he critiqued the story on a specific detail. So the story goes, when I was three years old, I went on a vacation to Broken Bow, Oklahoma at Arrowhead State Park. And when I was seesawing with my brothers, well, when both my brothers, the older brother on one side of me and the next oldest on the other, the middle brother always had middle child syndrome and couldn't stand me. And he got mad at one point and decided to get off, but he didn't realize that my legs were on the handle and part of the seesaw. So when he did, it shut up in the air and it broke my leg. I had to drive all the way back home with a broken leg. So I think intuitively, this is how you would tell maybe like someone over coffee a story, but you're not, this is not how you should tell a fiction story because there's really no sensory information in this example passage. So if you were to change that, you kind of want to ask yourself, what are the immediate sensations you would have if you're that you know three-year-old on a seesaw? We probably might start thinking about what does a seesaw feel like? What does it feel like on your thighs? Maybe there's like loose paint chips. Dig into your size. Maybe the seesaw is in motion, 
What does it feel like to go up and down? Is your stomach moving with it? Are you on top of it? Is there a handle? Is that kind of cold? No, it's hot. What does that tell you? Maybe it's summer. Maybe it's worn from use. Do you look around and you see like what's going on around you? There are trees. The trees have leaves. Is it, again, is it fall or is it summer? Is it hot all day maybe? And you, you can kind of say this is like expands outwards into this like a detailed scene just from this uh, specific vivid detail. So we're right near the end and that's why part eight is endings. So like, like jokes, uh, in a short story, you really, really need to have a strong ending. If the ending falls apart, people are gonna feel cheated. You hook them so well with the beginning, if you don't get them on the end, well, they're gonna, they're gonna leave it being like a little, a little bit of waste of time. With novels, it's a little more forgiving, I think, um, because you can have an enjoyable process for you know 95% of it. Um, and if you miss the mark, people can be like, well, I still enjoyed getting there. And so it's a little more palatable. Obviously it's undesirable. You don't wanna have a bad ending in your novel, but it's a little bit more palatable to have a bad ending in a novel than it is in a short story. Short story, you gotta stick that landing or else they, they feel like a waste of time. Um, short stories just cannot have bad endings. Uh, but I think most endings fall in maybe three categories. So there's the solution-based ending. You have to have that need versus want dichotomy. Um, so either the character gets what they want uh, or need, uh, or they don't. But either way, you're wrapping it up with a failure or a success, which is a solution. Uh, or if we were to use uh, Therese's idea about a character being wrong about something, either they discover they're wrong or they learn maybe that they're right in the sense of the, like they, they now even more reinforce that they are right, even if they're still wrong. Um, or they somehow they, they figure out that they are they are right, and the reader was the one who was wrong. Um, and I think these are these are most commonly deployed uh, in very linear stories, very very like uh, straightforward stories. Um, it's a very classical plot setting, um, and also it's a very common to novels. Um, and then you have the reverse ending, and this is where you have those escalation pattern setup endings. Um, so if you were to take that as you were saying that short story, the school where Bar Bartholomew escalates from like goldfish dying to humans dying. What he does at the very end is he starts, he flips it and starts talking about life and childhood and child rearing. Um, and it's just like a nice little like unexpected switch. You know, he went full into the humans dying and then just right in the end, he switched into something else. And it was satisfying because you felt like there was going to be more and it's going to get worse and worse and worse again. Um, and then he stopped it right there. And you can have open-ended and ambiguous endings. Uh, and these are some of my favorite. And I think these are some of the strongest you can do in a short story. Um, I find that short stories that end ambiguously the most engaging, especially if they're asking uh, two separate questions that are very hard to answer. Like there's just, you're not gonna get an answer to these like two polar opposites of what's a good choice. So a, a good writer just sets up the question and leaves the ending ambiguous. Um, Hawthorne's uh, Young Goodman Brown is one I thought of. Uh, it's ambiguous whether Young Goodman Brown actually really witnessed that ceremony and it leaves, it ends leaving that ambiguous because it's not necessary to, to, to the questions he brought up. Uh, and it also makes you like, it doesn't, it doesn't bookend the questions he brought up. It leaves them to be asked. Uh, another example is Guy Vanderhagen's short story, uh, TikTok. He ends it with a main character. He's about to get in a fist fight with a bodybuilder half his age. And you can assume what happens after that, but you don't know. And because it's, that's not what the story is about. The story is about the question it asked and it asks the question and it doesn't need to tell you the answer. He just wants to ask the question. And finally, editing. Uh, this is by far my favorite book on editing. It's called Self-Editing for Fiction Writers, How to Edit Yourself into Print. Uh, it basically breaks up editing into like 49 different major points. Uh, if you want the full list, I've actually turned uh, the book uh, into a PDF. So I have a PDF of all the, the checkpoint lists. And I'll, I'll show my email at the end if you want to get that. Um, I think I've actually grown it into 61 points. Uh, I've, I've continually added stuff over, over time. Uh, for example, I don't think there was a lot of dialogue stuff originally in it. Um, but as a more overview of my uh, editing process for short stories, generally I'll, I'll create like an editing document. Uh, this is something I'll add like notes, words, phrases, stuff I don't like. Words I use too much or themes I think are, are wrong or where I wanna go with it. Uh, it's just like an editing document that I'll always have with me as I'm writing the piece. Um, and I, I kind of create a list of things that I call me do going forward. Uh, I call these things enisms. And I mean by that, I have a list of things that I've created that I add to in every piece I do. And I call them enisms because I know I'm, I, I tend to do these things wrong. And so I always want to check the things I know I do wrong that are not like specific advice that anyone has. I know I do these things wrong and I know it's myself and I'm trying to correct it. Um, 
one, one of those things as I brought before is I use two basic nouns. Uh, so I use bottles or like stuff like that. I'm not using specific vivid detail. I'm using, uh, cause I'm, I'm worried about the character and the plot. I'm not thinking about the actual objects in the scenes. And that's something I need to force myself to do. Um, but here, here's my step-by-step -step little editing process. First, I'll write the first draft and I highly recommend you don't edit until you're done. This is always going to be the hardest part, uh, but you're trying to get that first draft done. Do not worry about the editing, just finish it. Then you can edit. Uh, if you must edit, I would say leave a comment for the edit, but don't actually edit it. Just put a little comment for yourself. Next, you're going to edit the first draft by fixing only the story. If you don't have a story right, you can't fix anything else until that story is perfect. You can't really move on. Once the story is perfect, then you can start fixing other stuff. But you need that base story there first. And now once the story and plot is kind of where you want it, go again and look at the characters, look at the word choice, the dialogue, the detail, do another run through and fix all those things. You know, look like read a sentence and go, character, word choice, dialogue, vivid detail, what do I got all there? Do I need all those things? There's some missing? You know, do, do it a step-by-step -step process. Um, and then finally, on that, like third draft or fourth draft, I'll print it off and then I'll read it out loud with a pen. I find just, you know, in a, in a technological age, printing it off makes it feel different and, and I sense it differently. Like I notice different things just in that different tactile form. Um, especially with reading out loud, you're going to notice like missteps or awkward phrasing much better when you read out loud. And then finally, you should consult your uh, version of the Ianism's document. Uh, what do you got a list of stuff that you felt like you did wrong or you do wrong commonly and just look through those things. Um, and then at the end there, I'll use my 61 point checklist just to, just to make sure I got everything. Um, and from there, you should have a finished short story that you're proud of. And I recommend you go out into the world and you do submissions. Uh, you submit them to periodicals, journals, papers. See if you get any bites. Uh, if you don't, keep at it. Uh, I do five submissions every Friday. I keep, I keep that tight, always five submissions. Um, if I don't have something I'm proud of, then I'll still do five submissions and I'll make sure I'll have some next week. Um, and I, I look at rejections as a sign of progress, not failure. And if you get a personally written rejection, uh, that's a big win. You know, somebody, somebody enjoyed it, but they wasn't right for your paper. Personally written rejections, and I know from doing readings myself, Big, big, big win. You know you're in the right direction there. But if you get rejected, then you know it's a sign to, you know, start looking at your work and see where you can fix it. Is it, is it is a beginning, uh, is it as engaging as it can be? Is the ending is, you know, does it wrap it up well? Um, yeah. But that's it. I got my email there, website. And if you want the, the slide deck, you can also get that. Are you open to questions, Ian? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Feel free to unmute yourselves or you can put the question in the chat. That's a good list, the uh, guide. I've used that before. Oh yes, Teresa, you, you can hear that. There's also, um, the, my favorite actually site for submissions is called the uh, Submission Grinder, G-R-I-N-D-R, -R, no E. Um, you can put in all your things. So you can be like, I want someone that pays a minimum. They pay uh, the maximum 3,000 words, and I'll just spit out every journal they have that meets those criteria. Very effective. Oh, yeah, I'll share the uh, contact in here. Oh, and someone asked for your contact info again, Ian. I'll just share the. Hi, Ian. Hey. I'm Carla. Thank you for that. That was great. Um, curious about so at the very beginning, one of your first slides, you had put away that th thesaurus, which is mm -hmm. like I, I love my thesaurus, <laughs> and then later you talked about um, using vivid detail. So I'm just wondering if do you mean in dialogue specifically avoid looking for fancy uh, words or so so i said in there when it, when a simpler more effective word will do not a word that's big just to be big uh -huh. but if in detail of course there are certain adjectives or stuff that are much more specific and much more effective at doing what you're trying to do but if you're just trying to change words to look like hey i know big words then that's mm -hmm. not effective for anyone you know 
Yeah. What about to, to make it so it's not repetitive, like in dialogue where you said, you know, just use a simple said, said Harry, mm -hmm. said Melanie, um, rather than yell so the opposite, or... what, What's going to happen is the opposite effect is going to happen if you switch up the said. They're not going to get stuck. Nobody's, nobody cares about a repetition. They don't care about the said. They care about the attribution. Who said it? They're not, nobody's worried about the actual word said. They just want to know so they can follow on dialogue. Like for me, when I'm reading, I'm actually not even really reading the word. I'm looking for the name. Right. You know what I mean? So once you yeah. switch it up, all of a sudden that reader pauses and they're out of the story. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ian, I really liked your example of the uh, the the dialogue. I think that was excellent advice, and I don't think I've seen it done any better. Um, how to make not boring dialogue? <laughs> that was awesome. I have no idea where I, where I heard that either. I've tried to look so many times and find it. Mm -hmm. It was so like so it was something I read, and it was just like, oh my god, that is so clearly a better way to do dialogue is you just and you just make them not answer each other, and all of a sudden it feels real. And so easy to do that. Like, it's just, it's not that hard intellectually to just make two people not answer each other's questions. Yeah, it's a good trick. Carrie Ann, did you still need my uh, contact info? Or did you see it? Um, I have a very basic question about length yeah. of a short story. I mean, I know there's uh, quite a range, but I don't know. Can you expand on that a bit? Or like, are there certain lengths for certain types of short stories or for certain places you'd be submitting or just do it as long as seems right and as, as long as it's within some range, it'll be okay? Yeah, there, there are like uh, general ranges for classifications of writing. Um, my my uh, suggestion would be don't worry about them. You should be writing... The story first. The story will tell you how long it should be, uh, and then and then you and then you can go put in whatever classification that fits in after. Don't worry about it first, like because often you'll find like I'm writing a short story, and then all of a sudden it turns like, oh no, this is a novel. And if you're worried about that, you might just cut off the legs of your novel, but you just had a good idea for a novel, right? But the, but the, uh, if you want the answer, the upper limit is usually like I think around ten thousand for a short story, and then that ten to to. 25 to 30 to 35 it's, it gets very amorphous in those higher ends but uh it's the kind of the um the novella and then novels especially first novels is highly recommended to you 40 to 70 thousand words um and that's because people who don't know who you are don't want to read a big book but they also don't want to read a really really small one either they want to read a nice in between two to three hundred word Where do you normally get your ideas from? Uh, it's interesting because I, I get it from all the stuff I consume. So I have a list of like maybe 50 some ideas. And so as I'm reading, I notice I'll make little connections of like, oh, I like that. I like that. And then, and then my brain will start connecting those connections in another story. And I'll have like an idea that I can combine them to. There's a, there's a good quote that originality is not something new. It's something combined. I have another question, but I don't want to hog the space, but I'm going to ask it. And somebody else has another question first. Yeah, go for it. On. Do you ever, um, so I, I, in my work, I take people's stories. I listen to people's stories and I create a story out of it. So they're actually giving me all the content. It's not my original ideas. It's just the way that I put it out there. Do you ever do that? And do you have I mean, so I'm always looking for detail. I'm asking for, for detail so I can put in some of the things about what people were wearing or what the mm -hmm. weather was like that day or whatever. And also looking for, um, you know, that sort of call to adventure. If you look at the hero's journey, like what, mm -hmm. what happened to, to, to bring action to the story. So I'm just curious if you have any techniques for that type of story writing. So techniques of how to take real life stuff and turn them into fiction? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, not fiction. It still needs to be true, but it needs okay. to make it interesting for an audience. Have you, ha have you heard of, um, there's a phrase for that. So there's a phrase for fiction 
that is masquerading as fiction, but it's actually nonfiction. Sylvia Plath is a uh, bell jar, very famous for that. It's, it's, it's a French phrase. Jar. Yeah. So she, she, it's basically like her life, but it's fictionalized. Um, a, a modern writer would be uh, Tao Lin. Uh, he did his novel Taipei. Um, so you, what's you, the what, term? What would, uh, let me look. The bell jar. Roman A. Clef, called a Roman A. Clef, where it's basically a real story, uh, like an autobiographical, but told as if it's a fictional story in a narrative form. Yeah, the reason got it. And so I, I, my recommendation would probably to be read stuff like that. Roman A. Clef. That's right. Thank you. And if you search that, you'll find a lot of examples of that, people taking from their life and turning them into fictional stories. There's also a very uh, funny, funny uh, joke uh, about if you ever read about a man who's real, give him a very small penis and he won't, uh, he won't say it's him. <laughs> the name again, Sylvia? Plath, P-L-A-T-H. And her book is called The Bell Jars, the only novel she wrote. Very, very good novel. Okay, thank you. Sometimes I hear advice regarding two specific details like brand names or pop culture references. Many people find them distracting. How can I balance being specific in my details but not over the top? So, so I actually use that example. It's, a, it's an, a really good question. For, with the coffee shop uh, example that I used, I would say you wanna use the best example you can do with the least amount of examples that are gonna make people see the whole coffee shop without having to describe the whole coffee shop. So you wanna do as vivid and specific as possible, but the best uh, examples that are gonna let you see the rest of the thing. You don't wanna describe a whole coffee shop. You wanna describe specific small details and the rest, we all know coffee shops like that. So we'll be able to imagine it just from those small details. Anyone else have any questions? Um, I had something I would like to talk about a little bit, I guess. Yes, um, uh, when you were part six, when you were talking about dialogue and how to write effectively, um, you said avoid phonetic spellings and accents, like the reader will have to act out the accent while they're reading. And I mean, I guess that that would, that would only apply if you don't naturally have an accent, right? Or if you're not like- yeah like an indigenous person writing from Northern Saskatchewan is gonna write differently from a non-indigenous person growing up in the city, right? So like being will, able to stay honest to who you are as an author as well and bringing that voice forward is also super important. Yeah, I think that's, as I said, I said you can do dialectical variations, yeah. but not quite an accent. Like you don't wanna force someone else to make the accent, right? So you're, you're writing, you're writing all you're writing is public facing, right? Like if you're putting it out for someone to read, you want them to read it. So you don't want to force them to do the accent, but you want to do the yeah. dialectical variation of word choices. So you can tell where they're from by the word choices. And that'll be very obvious. If you are doing that dialectical variation, people have different word choices. So for example, um, people might say ain't in certain areas. Um, there's, a, there's a really good one from North Edmonton that North people, people in North Side Edmonton are like blanking right now. Say a certain they don't they don't do a grammatically correct phrasing, but it's very clear if you're from the north side that you talk like that. Now it's not an accent; it's just like you're using word choices that are clearly you're part of a subgroup. I'm trying to think of the um, Irish writer who, or no, Scottish, I think he's Scottish, and he wrote, he writes um, 
often with uh, uh, could be Roddy Doyle. Scots, Scots is a little bit different because it's uh, it is a, a different language to some people. Not, right, not to right, yeah. Yeah, so Scots itself is they use a lot of English words mm -hmm. because they both come from Old English, but they uh, but it, depending on who you ask, is a, is a different language or a dialect. But you can, like I said, use dialectical variations. That's not an accent. That's just yeah. a different way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's English. There's English dialect Scots, and there's also Scots. I just did a. As you can tell. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm excited about that question because. I uh, have done a ton of research on the Scots language. <laughs> yeah, I like I like Roddy Doyle, as I recall. I haven't read him for a long time. But he's Irish. I was wrong. I'm thinking he's of Irish, a Scottish yeah. writer. Yeah, I can't think of it. Is right it uh, Hugh McDermott, possibly? No, it could be. Well, if there aren't any more um, questions, I'll say it very slowly <laughs> in case there is anyone who has been dying to ask a question and is shy. Nope. Okay. Um, thank you so much everyone. Uh, I think we'll have some more of these workshops in the new year. Hopefully some of them could be in person. Um, but would you mind telling me uh, if you had a choice of between in person and online for this kind of workshop, what would you prefer? Just shout it out or throw it in the chat for me. I'm curious. Online? Online, online. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. I had uh, I thought that this is just a good format, no matter when. And someone lives in East End. Yep, it's hard to get to Saskatoon from East End. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. And thank you very much, Ian. I think you gave uh, everyone a lot to uh, think about and to work with. And I really hope to see all those short stories in um, the literary journals very soon. Okay. Me too. Me too. <laughs> see you. Thanks for the shout out, Ian. <laughs> Bye. No worries.